this 1970 law, and I tried to give you the historical context of why it was passed, and that's because of uh, all the, uh, the widespread use of drugs uh, uh, by people my age at the time. Uh, but, um, uh, and so uh, they passed this uh, uh, Drug uh, Controlled Substances Act, uh, and they created a new enforcement agency to regulate those drugs that they felt were likely to be abused. Uh, and uh, the, originally, these were drugs that tended to cause physical addiction, but they've actually, as we'll see, they broadened this thing as far as drugs that can be abused, because now it includes anabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids, it's not like you become physically addicted, uh, per se, not in the same way as you would to uh, heroin or, or, you know, or uh, codeine. Uh, but uh, uh, anything they think will be abused. And uh, the enforcement agency uh, are commonly called the NARCs. Uh, that's the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. And that's under the U.S. Department of Justice. So this is a totally different agency from the FDA. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, what they did is they established five schedules of controlled substances uh, based on their uh, potential for causing dependency or being abused, uh, and also based upon uh, how useful they were, therapeutic they are. Uh, if we look at, um, uh, on the bottom of page A6, this is a simplified uh, scheme here of the five schedules of controlled substances. I'm going to go through them in a little bit more detail, but this is on the bottom of A6. So you can see Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3, Schedule 4, Schedule 5, and it gives some examples of these. But uh, let's, uh, let's be a little bit more systematic. On page uh, A7, on A7, so any time a, uh, a physician, a dentist, uh, anybody who's able to write a prescription uh, is going to write a prescription that is regulated under the Controlled Substances Act, they have to be registered with the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. And so they have to actually uh, have a DEA number uh, so that they can track the person who's uh, prescribing controlled substances. Who's seen a prescription form where it has a DEA number? Have you ever seen that? Mo mo almost all the dental forms will have the DEA number on that. Uh, why? Because commonly uh, narcotic drugs are prescribed by dentists, you know, for pain relief. Um, anyhow, uh, the, the, uh, we said there are five schedules. The schedule number one, very easy to remember, they are illegal. So if it's a schedule one controlled substance, it is illegal in the United States. Uh, the schedule two through five, if you write a prescription, the prescription, and you have to always date a prescription, uh, the prescription is good for six months, and after that, you can't use it if it's a controlled substance. Um, as I wrote, the prescription can be filled out by anyone, a uh, dental hygienist, uh, you can fill this out, but it has to be prescribed, uh, uh, signed by a person who is uh, licensed to go and uh, prescribe drugs. Okay, so what is uh, Schedule 1? Schedule 1 substances can't be prescribed at all. They are illegal. They are not listed. They are not listed in the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, USP, the United States Pharmacopeia. And these are basically drugs that are viewed as having a high potential for dependency and no accepted therapeutic use. So an example of a Schedule I controlled substance is heroin and LSD. Uh, so you can't go to the, uh, you can't get a prescription for LSD. You can't get, you know, you say, gee, I really like to have some LSD. Uh, you can't get a prescription <laughs> for heroin. Now that's in the United States. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, uh, Canada, heroin is a, a legal drug. Uh, it, it's a controlled substance in Canada, but you can get a prescription for heroin, but you can't get it in the United States. Um, now, uh, Schedule II controlled substances, so these can be prescribed. They are viewed as having a high potential for dependency, but they have accepted therapeutic uses, at least as far as the United States is concerned. Now, if you're prescribing a Schedule II, or as we're going to see, Schedule III controlled substance, you have to use a special prescription form called a security or tamper-resistant prescription form. Has anybody ever seen these? These are special forms that can only be used, uh, or I, uh, let me put it this way, if you're prescribing a Schedule II or Schedule III controlled substance, 
you must use this special tamper-resistant form. You can't use a regular form. It's a special form. And uh, let's just show you what it looks like, in case you uh, haven't seen it. Take a look at page A12. So on page A12, all right, this is a, uh, a special security or tamper-resistant form, prescription form. And uh, among the features that it has, and it has to have by law, is the DEA number is printed on the form. It's not like they can write it. It should be printed. Uh, the, um, you'll notice that when I photocopy this prescription, you might be able to make out that in the background it says boy. So in other words, you can't photocopy it. It won't work because it appears. Now, you don't see that on the form. But if anybody were to fax it or, or photocopy it, because they want to make more copies, they want to get more of the, uh, this drug, uh, so it, they can't fake it. It's tamper resistant. Uh, it shows up uh, where anytime you apply heat to it, like in the form of a photocopy machine, or faxing it, this void appears. So they know that you're, it's not the real prescription. Another interesting feature, and we're going to talk about prescription writing in a moment, uh, we're going to be learning that the first line, and I'll go through this in more detail, the first line, the prescription uh, basically consists of three lines. And the first line is the name of the drug. This happens to be, and this is classic, you know, where the prescriber, they write it so you can't even read it. And that's, and so that's not required that you have terrible handwriting. But this is a prescription for Adderall. Adderall is a, a stimulant. It's an amphetamine type of drug. It's actually being used in this case for ADD. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, the second line, and, and we're, we'll learn the first line is the name of the drug and the dosage. This is 10 milligrams uh, pills. The second line is the number of pills. So the prescriber is prescribing 60 pills of Adderall. Now notice on the right-hand side, they then check off that the number of pills is between 50 to 74. So you'd say, well, like, what's the point of that? So they can't change the 6 to an 8. Or they can't write 160. Because they've already checked off that it's 50 to 74. Does everybody see what they've done? So they're making it very difficult to change this. But after the prescriber hands the patient the prescription, they can't just modify it easily. To get, to get a higher number of pills or something. And they can't uh, photocopy it. Uh, and, uh, all right, and we're also going to see, uh, printed on these forms, it indicates whether there's refills uh, available. And as we're gonna see on a Schedule II uh, controlled substance, you cannot refill it. You have to have a new prescription each time. They don't allow refills on uh, Schedule II. Here on the lower one, this is just a, another one, and you can clearly see the void that appears when I photocopied it. Now there's really a whole bunch of features on the tamper-resistant form. If you look on page A14, on A14, and I'm certainly not going to you know, just test you on all the details, I just thought you'd find this interesting. Uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting features, and this, this basically goes through all the stuff that is unique to these tamper-resistant forms that uh, if you're prescribing a Schedule II or Schedule III controlled substance, you must use this kind of form. Now, if it's not, as we'll see, if it's a Schedule IV controlled substance, or five, or if you're writing a prescription that's not a controlled substance, like penicillin, you don't even need to use this form. You can use a good old regular form that doesn't have all this stuff. Um, okay, so we'll come back to that. Let's go back to A7. So back on A7, if you have a question, just yell it out. Uh, on page A7, so uh, it requires a new prescription for each refill for a Schedule II controlled substance. Uh, in other words, no refills are allowed on this form. So you either have to circle zero or no refills, NR. Uh, the quantity prescribed uh, cannot exceed a 30-day supply. Uh, so you can't have more than a 30-day supply of pills, however many pills that might be. And uh, you cannot phone in or fax in the prescription. In other words, 
You can't say, um, uh, this is Dr. Samantha. I'm on the phone right now. Uh, yes, I want to prescribe my patient. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, prescribe. You can't phone in a prescription for a, control, a schedule to control substance. All right, so uh, the whole idea is why not? Because it could be the patient who's calling in and pretending he's Dr. Smith. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, what are some examples of Schedule II controlled substances? It includes narcotic pain relievers or analgesics, including morphine, codeine, and Demerol. These are all uh, uh, legal drugs in the United States. Probably you've had codeine yourself, uh, but uh, uh, it is a Schedule II controlled substance. It also includes stimulants. Cocaine is a legal drug in the United States. You can't prescribe it. But it is a highly regulated Schedule II controlled substance. Remember, Schedule I are illegal. So this is the most stringent category that could be prescribed. And it also includes uh, dexedrine and Adderall. And uh, dexedrine and Adderall are used for a number of purposes, including ADD. Uh, and it includes sedatives. Uh, sedatives, anybody know what sedatives are used for? What does sedation mean? Yeah, relax, go to sleep. These are things that, that help you sleep. So this includes the barbiturate sedatives like pentobarbital and secanol. These are all Schedule II so, uh, also. So uh, basically, in contrasting stimulants and sedatives, stimulants are the uppers and uh, sedatives are the downers. They used to, in the street language, call them whites and reds. The whites were the stimulants and the reds were the downers. You'd say, how do you know that stuff? Don't ask. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, all right, so that's Schedule two. On Schedule three controlled substances, now, the, as we go from Schedule one to Schedule two to Schedule three, they're easing up a little bit. They are a little bit less regulated. This still requires uh, the special uh, security prescription forms, uh, but you can have refill instructions. You can have up to five uh, refills every six months, if noted on the prescription. And you can phone in or fax in uh, the, the prescription. So Schedule 2 is highly regulated. Schedule 3, uh, they uh, ease up a little bit as far as the regulations. On, um, on page A8, the back side, so what, what drugs are Schedule 3 controlled substances? So Schedule 3 controlled substances basically is when you combine a narcotic with a non-narcotic, it drops from a Schedule 2 to a Schedule 3. In other words, if it's a prescription for codeine, it's a Schedule 2. If it's codeine with Tylenol, have you ever seen that prescribed? Tylenol with codeine? It drops to a Schedule 3. And incidentally, Tylenol with codeine is still a widely prescribed medication in, uh, by dentists. Uh, Vicodin is a Schedule 3, because why? Uh, we actually mentioned on Monday that Vicodin is a combination of a narcotic called hydrocodone, kind of sounds like codeine, with acetaminophen, Tylenol. So uh, when you combine a narcotic with a non-narcotic, it drops to a Schedule 3. Why do they do that? I think why they do that is because if you really want to get narcotics, you don't want it combined with a non-narcotic. You know, so they feel that it's a little bit less likely to be abused than the real, pure, just narcotic drug. Um, also, anabolic steroids, which is something they added more recently, are Schedule Three controlled substances. And that's, again, because of the abuse. Think about how, how many articles have you read about baseball players and other athletes taking anabolic steroids. So they really want to regulate this stuff. All right, then that takes us to Schedule Four controlled substances. Uh, these you can use a regular prescription. You can, you can use the tamper-resistant. You can always use the tamper-resistant for anything. You can use the tamper-resistant for even penicillin. But uh, you don't have to use uh, the tamper-resistant for uh, uh, penicillin or Schedule Four, Schedule Five controlled substances. It must be used for Schedule Two or Schedule Three. What's an example of a Schedule IV controlled substance? Uh, Valium-like drugs like Xanax or Valium, Ambien. Anybody know what people commonly use Ambien for? Sleep. Help them sleep. Uh, people take an Ambien if they're taking a long plane trip so they can sleep on the plane. Uh, and Meridia. Anybody know what Meridia is used for? 
Uh, it's it actually used to lose weight and so on. So, uh, but um, anyhow, the Schedule Five uh, controlled substances. Uh, so, what's Schedule Five? This is the lowest level of controlled substance, and so uh, these are viewed as uh, drugs that with a little little potential to be abused, and there are really no refill limitations. You, you can use a regular prescription form. You still have to have a DEA number. You have to have a DEA number. You have to be registered with the Drug Enforcement Administration for any controlled substance. Now, what are uh, examples of Schedule Five? I'm going to give you just two examples. Uh, one example is Robitussin AC. And you'd say, what's Robitussin AC? What's Robitussin get used for? <laughs> Coughs. The word tuss actually means to cough. A tu an anti-tussive means against coughing. Anti is against, tussive means coughing. So robitussin is used for coughing. And the AC, the C in it means it's got some codeine in it. So they just feel that you know the level of amount of codeine in robitussin cough medication, you gotta be really desperate to get high, to drink that many <laughs> bottles of robitussin to get high. You know, this is not like taking morphine or, or codeine or something like that. You've got to drink a lot of Robitussin. And the second example I'll give is a drug called Lomotil. Has anybody ever heard of Lomotil? Anti-diarrhea. Huh? Anti-diarrhea. Exactly. It's anti-diarrhea. It's used when you got really, really bad diarrhea. And you might say, well, what's, why? Uh, first of all, why it's called Lomotil, and that's a registered brand name. Remember, I, we learned on Monday that when we put the little R in a circle, that's a registered brand name. I also mentioned that most registered brand names are three syllables. Lomotil, all right? That's just how they tend to name them. They, the generic or official names are never quite as easy to remember. Uh, so Tylenol, three syllables, isn't it, Tylenol? Uh, but uh, acetaminophen is a little bit hard to remember. Anyhow, why it's called low motil is it lowers GI motility. Low motil, motil, low motil, low motility. Decreases GI motility. Now, why is this a regular, a controlled substance? Uh, you might have learned that narcotic drugs have a side effect of causing constipation. Has anybody ever heard of that? A side effect of, of narcotics, including codeine, including Vicodin, is they can cause constipation. They take advantage of that because if somebody's got really bad diarrhea, the runs, they take something that's got a narcotic in it to cause them to constipate them so that they don't have such bad diarrhea. So it is a, uh, it is a narcotic, but it's very, very weak. It has very little of the euphoric effects of a narcotic but it does still retain the uh, constipating effect of narcotics. So it is a, a regulated or controlled substance, but uh, you know, somebody to get high on Lomotil really has to be desperate to go and uh, want to get constipated like this. All right, so these are uh, some examples of uh, uh, controlled substances, uh, uh, five schedules of them. Uh, let me give you one last law uh, it's not so much that I'm going to test you on it, but it's worth noting. In 1984, a, a federal law was passed. This law requires that all generic drugs meet the same standards of efficacy uh, as the brand names. In other words, this federal law says that if you get CVS brand atorvastatin, it has to work as well as Lipitor. Atorvastat. So, it, it, you know, commonly, you, you, I'm sure you yourself have at, wondered, or you've been asked, are the generics as good as the brand names? And this federal law requires that the generics be, uh, they have to demonstrate and prove uh, uh, pharmacologically that that drug it meets the same efficacy or is as, 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 as effective as the brand name. Remember, after 20 years, anybody, any manufacturer can make that uh, drug, but it has to meet the same standards. So, in theory at least, all the generics should work just as well as the brand names, and they sure cost less. Yep? Yeah. Um, just to go back to like, when you were being prescribed, and uh -huh. like some schedules say it can be found as fast, and the others 
So if it can't be found in practice, how does, how does the prescription get out? Well, uh, they, they, uh, it means that even if it appears void on it, if it's a schedule uh, uh, for a controlled substance, it's okay. Because okay, so they do allow it to be faxed. For schedule two, like how, would, how does a, somebody get like a prescription for us? Oh, they have to carry it. And they have to hand yeah, carry it to the uh, pharmacist. Oh, but like the patient can do that. The patient, the patient the the patient's allowed to do it. They want to see the actual pen writing, okay. right? So that it's not just a photocopy or a faxed copy. So, uh, that, you know, so they can actually see the, you know, ink on it. And uh, that's how it has to be done. And if anybody's ever gotten, uh, if I used uh, how to get a prescription for a controlled substance and see these special forms. Uh, let me, I, I want, before I go any further, we've kind of presented the laws that I wanted to do. Uh, let me kind of summarize a couple of concepts here. And uh, so I want to look at page, if I can find it. Yeah, well, let's look at uh, how to reorganize this. Yeah, page A20. So let's take a look at page A20. So I'll make a little note here. And on page A20, I made a little chart. So let me give you some examples of drugs so that we can understand the difference between the FDA and the DEA. Because there's two regulatory agencies that have overlapping uh, responsibilities in terms of medications. So uh, I'll, give you, I'll list three drugs here. Uh, let's uh, use the drug, uh, how about, uh, we'll do uh, Vicodin. And we'll do Amoxicillin. Amoxicillin is a generic name. And, uh, and let's do, um, uh, uh, we'll do uh, Advil. Okay, these are three drugs very widely commonly used. So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is under the U.S. Health Department, is the drug, uh, agency that approves drugs, and they determine, among other things, whether the drug can be uh, sold over the counter or whether it requires a prescription. All right? So what does the FDA say about Vicodin? Does Vicodin, can that be sold over the counter? No, it requires a prescription. And what do we call, uh, what's the other term we use for prescription drug? A legend drug. So this is a legend drug. It, it requires a prescription. Legend means it has a, uh, requires a prescription. You remember on Monday I said the reason why they call it a legend drug is it has that label on it. Federal law prohibits the dispensing without a prescription. Anything that requires a prescription, it says that. So it can't be sold over the counter. All right, now, uh, the, all right, so that's what the FDA says about Vicodin. What does the DEA say? Does the DEA care about Vicodin? Yes, it is a controlled substance. So in other words, in, uh, the, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration under the U.S. Department of Justice call, says this drug can be abused, and in fact, Vicodin is a Schedule uh, three controlled substance. So since it's a Schedule Three controlled substance, uh, and I'll just remind you, you'd say, well, how, I, how do I remember it's Schedule Three? Schedule One are like LSD, they're illegal. Schedule Two are like pure narcotics, so just morphine by itself, just codeine by itself, Demerol by itself. But we said once you combine a narcotic with a non-narcotic, it drops to a Schedule Three, so it's a Schedule Three. So this requires Schedule 3. We, we talked about the rules. So for Schedule 3, uh, you still need a tamper-resistant uh, prescription form, a special prescription form for it. OK, now, amoxicillin. What does the FDA say about amoxicillin? Is it over-the-counter drug or a alleged a prescription drug? It's a legend drug. The FDA does require a prescription. 
Now, you might wonder, well, why? Why do they, why do they require drugs to have prescriptions and others can be sold over the counter? There are many reasons. Sometimes the drug itself has a lot of adverse effects and they really don't want people to buy it over the counter. They want to make sure that a doctor or dentist is prescribing it, so you're under the uh, uh, direction, the supervision of a prescriber. Uh, in, the, uh, in the case of amoxicillin, which is an antibiotic, the big concern of the FB, FDA is that if everybody wakes up every morning thinking, you know, I might get sick, so I think I'll take an <laughs> antibiotic, then what we, as you know, soon these antibiotics will be ineffective against the bacteria because they will all develop resistance because everybody's just taking them constantly. So they just don't want people taking, popping a, an antibiotic every morning like they pop a uh, vitamin pill. So that, there's a number of reasons why they want it uh, to the only uh, doctors or dentists to prescribe it. All right, now, does the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, care about amoxicillin? Is it likely to be abused, you know, uh, cause physical addiction or anything like that? No. It is not a controlled substance at all. So you don't need a DEA number to prescribe it, and you certainly don't need a tamper-resistant prescription form. Any prescription form will work, and you don't need any DEA number. Okay, now, uh, Advil. Advil, which uh, is generic name is ibuprofen. So what does the FDA say about uh, Advil? It's an OTC, it's an over-the-counter drug. They say, you know, uh, Ibuprofen, Advil, uh, we don't really have to worry too much about this. It doesn't have any overly serious adverse effects. Uh, it's, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, people taking Advil every day and then they, it won't work anymore. Uh, so uh, we're just gonna make that an over-the-counter drug. You don't have to have a prescription for it. All right, uh, now, uh, does the DEA uh, care about Advil? No. no. Uh, and so uh, the DEA doesn't regulate uh, Advil, it doesn't regulate amoxicillin, it's not a controlled substance. So I've given you three examples, everything from uh, a uh, drug that's over the counter, a drug that requires a prescription but is not a controlled substance, and a drug that requires a prescription, and in addition it is a controlled substance, so you have to have a DEA number, and you have to even use a special prescription form, a tamper-resistant form. Does everybody follow that? So there are these two overlapping agencies. Okay, uh, back on page A8, back on page A8. Uh, just a, a brief uh, comment. I think you will eventually have a course that covers uh, laws uh, pertaining to uh, dental hygiene, is that right? Yeah. Laws and ethics, and you have to take an actual law and ethics uh, test now. Now, nothing to worry about, just another thing to do, but it, it's, it's an easy one. Uh, so, uh, but let me just, uh, since you haven't taken the law and ethics uh, class yet, let me just make one brief comment. Um, as you know, doctors and dentists do get sued. If you didn't know that, they do. Uh, probably every doctor has been sued, and many dentists have been sued. Uh, not as many dentists as doctors have been sued. I think every doctor has been sued. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, they have people now sue everybody. They sue hospitals. They've sued nurses. They've now sued pharmacists. And they, uh, in theory, could even sue dental hygienists. Uh, why not? Now, the, uh, the, now, usually the major thing that protects nurses and dental hygienists is usually somebody wants to sue, wants to collect a lot, a lot of money, and so uh, they figure, let's sue doctors and dentists and hospitals, they've got more money than nurses and dental hygienists do. So that's the main thing benefiting you, so I guess there's some benefits in not making as much. Uh, but um, uh, they, they, people have been sued for everything. Now. Uh, on page uh, A9, and A9 if I can find mine, yeah, on, uh, let me just, uh, without getting into details of laws and all that, I wrote that there are three major types of civil actions. Now, uh, in, in uh, law, there are what are called, um, uh, th there are uh, uh, civil actions, 
And, uh, and then there's also actions taken by the district attorney, what are called criminal actions. So if, uh, in other words, if you've done something that's really pretty bad, uh, you don't even have to wait for somebody, an individual to sue you, the, the, the uh, district attorney uh, can, can, can uh, impose uh, 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 actions against, uh, criminal actions against you. But focusing on civil actions, civil actions are lawsuits taken by an individual. And they fall into three broad categories. We call these, uh, uh, these suits, these lawsuits, a tort, not to be confused with that type of pastry. So uh, these are called misfeasance torts, nonfeasance torts, and malfeasance torts. And these are kind of listed in increasing order of severity. So what's a misfeasance? The word misfeasance kind of sounds like the word mistake. It's where somebody did, was doing something that is part of their license, but, you know, they made a mistake. So you can, in theory, be sued for making a mistake. That's called a misfeasance tort. Now, what's a nonfeasance tort? A nonfeasance tort is where you had a license to do something, you should have done something, and you failed to do something that should have been done. So you, it's a nonfeasance. You didn't do something that really you sh was your responsibility to do. Now, uh, the example I always used to give, it's not quite as good today as it was uh, just about three years ago, is... Uh, uh, up until about three years ago, uh, I think many of you know that if a patient indicated on their patient history, their medical history, that they had a medical history of rheumatic heart disease, you had to pre-medicate them with an antibiotic. Now, that's no longer required. But uh, if you failed to pre-medicate them, that would be a non-feasance. Because at the time, you, the law said you must, if somebody says they have a history of rheumatic heart disease, and the medical standard was to go and pre-medicate them with an antibiotic to reduce their risk of uh, uh, myocarditis, uh, uh, endocarditis. So uh, therefore, that would be a non-feasance suit that they could impose. Um, a malfeasance tort, and mal means like bad, is this is where you do something and you did it wrong. And what makes it worse than a, a, a misfeasance where you made a mistake or you did something wrong is that in a malfeasance, you were doing something, you did something wrong, and it wasn't even within your, licensed, uh, within your license to do. So let's say that you decided, you know, you're kind of working late one night on a patient, and they say, you know, I got a real bad toothache right here. You know, uh, I don't want to come back tomorrow morning for the dentist. The dentist already left for the day. Um, you think you could... Uh, think you could fill this cavity? And you'd say, yeah, I watched the dentist a few times. So uh, if you go and uh, start to uh, uh, do, a, uh, 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 do a filling uh, for a dental carry uh, using the drill, that's not within your license, your scope of practice. So, uh, and then if you did it wrong, so that's called a malfeasance. So those are kind of increasing order of severity. All right, so much for that. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about laws and ethics in a future course. Um, as far as sources of information, uh, on Monday we talked about the United States Pharmacopeia, the USP. Uh, that's the official listing of drugs that are legal in the United States. And the, w the way it identifies the drug is by what's called the official or generic name. The, what is the PDR? The, many of you have heard of the PDR, the Physician's Desk Reference. This is kind of a big, thick book. They, it comes out every year, and uh, it's got pictures of pills. But you don't need that anymore because I give you my website link. Uh, and it's got pictures of pills. It's uh, very nice in that uh, it, at the beginning of the Physician's Desk Reference, you can look up drugs by generic name, you can look them up by brand name, you can even look them up by manufacturer or by the pill that it comes in. So it's very useful uh, because it allows you to look up a drug in many different ways. However, the information that's actually printed or published in the physician's desk reference is simply the package inserts uh, provided to the professional prescriber. So in other words, the PDR, the information you're reading about the drug, is, quote, not objective. 
It is simply the information that the manufacturer provides to the prescriber. Now, they can't lie about a, a, a drug, but they're not going to say that our drug is probably just the, you know, the second best drug. It's second in efficacy only to this other drug. They're not going to say that. So uh, they will just say our drug works really well in doing this and this and this. Um, if you want to get a more objective understanding of which drugs are viewed by people who study pharmacology, which drugs are considered the best drugs or better drugs, which ones are considered not as good drugs, then you have to look at some objective source that's not just printed or published by the manufacturer of the drug. So the problem with the PDR is it's just the package inserts provided by the manufacturer. So that's why you know, people go to uh, site, either websites or books that are deal with the subject of pharmacology where presumably academics who study this stuff can objectively evaluate the drug. All right, so I just thought I'd point that out. So a PDR is not a pharmacology book. It is simply a compendium of the package inserts uh, made available by manufacturers of drugs. Uh, okay, on page uh, A10, on A10, I want to tell you a little bit about prescription writing. Uh, I did, this is not something I originally, when I first started teaching uh, this class, I didn't originally include prescription writing. This was actually suggested by the director of the dental hygiene program at the time. I don't know if you've heard of Ula Lemborn, but uh, Ula came before... Uh, well, there's been a number of people uh, since Ula. Uh, again, I've been around since all of them. All of them have retired except me, so it's just that. Uh, but uh, before that, that was Phyllis Beamsterboer. And uh, I think at one time, in order to be the director of the program, you had to come from Scandinavia. So because it was Phyllis Beamsterboer from Holland, and then it was Ula Lemborn from Sweden. And, uh, but uh, and then later, uh, Ara uh, took over, and then uh, Lisa took over, and then now Carmen is the current uh, director. But anyhow, uh, Ulla had asked me to cover prescription writing. I don't know why, but she said, then, can you do that? And I said, sure. All right, so um, let me just look at, at a, this is kind of a traditional prescription form. And uh, it's divided into three parts right here. And uh, these are all written on page uh, A11, so we'll get to it. But uh, this is called the heading. This is the heading. It's a little bit like when you write a letter. This is the heading. This is the body of the uh, prescription form. And this is the closing. And what we're going to see is that what's in, the, what's in the heading of the prescription is uh, not only information about the prescriber of the drug, in this case it's Joe Doe, and, uh, and uh, the, the dentist's address and phone number, but it's also got the information that you would fill in about the patient. So typically they, you need to write the patient's name, uh, the date of the prescription, uh, they might have a place for address and age, or they might not, but uh, you have to identify the patient. That's in the heading. The body of the prescription is the most important part, and that's the part we're going to focus on. The body of the prescription is the actual drug that's being prescribed, and there are three lines uh, in the body. The first line is the name of the drug and the dosage. So the name of the drug and the dosage. All right, so they would write uh, 10 milligrams, 250 milligram, you know, tablet, 10 milligram tablet. Or if, it, if it's a liquid, they might say it's 125 milligrams per 5 milliliters. So this, that's where they give the dosage or concentration of the drug. The second line is the number of pills that are being uh, prescribed, the number of tablets. You know, 20 tablets, uh, 12 tablets, uh, uh, 100 tablets, uh, 125 milliliters. So that's the amount. The third line, uh, and incidentally, the second line has this, it begins with DISP, dispense. Dispense 10 pills, dispense 60 pills, dispense uh, 125 milliliters. The third line has this abbreviation SIG. 
And sig is signa. And you'd say, what's signa or sig? That's the directions to be written on the uh, label of the, uh, uh, of the uh, drug. So in other words, you know they always type out on the label of the uh, drug, on the little pill container, the directions to the patient. So what follows SIG or Cigna, SIG is an abbreviation for Cigna, are the directions to the patient. So, in, and they commonly will use abbreviations. There is no requirement to use abbreviations, but they commonly do. So in this case, what are the directions to the patient? One tab, all right, so they're supposed to take one tablet. Q, Q means every, every four to six hours. PRN, anybody know what PRN is? It's, uh, we'll see it written in a moment. It's if Latin for pro renata, which means as needed. So PRN means as needed for pain. So the directions that would be written on the bottle, on the prescription bottle, would be take one tablet every four to six hours as needed for pain. All right? Now, there's no requirement that you have to use abbreviations, but they kind of like making it secret. You know, It's like nobody knows what I'm so, uh, so that's the, those are the three uh, lines of the body, and that's the most important part. Now, what's in the closing? What's in the closing is where the prescriber would sign their name, and uh, they're, they're, they might uh, have uh, they might write in or have the DEA number printed, and there might also be refill instructions. Uh, and also, we're going to show you this. Nowadays, they might also have a instruction for whether a generic drug can be substituted. So they might write it out for Lipitor, but it might say generic acceptable. So that way, because if they don't write the generic is acceptable, then either the pharmacist must give the brand name, because that's what they wrote, or they would have to, they could ask, the pharmacist could ask the patient, would you like me to call your doctor to see if you can take if the generic is acceptable, because if you get the brand name, it's going to cost you $150, and if you get the generic, it's $15. All right? And the pay, a lot of people today will say, you know, really, I have to get this pretty frequently. I don't want to spend $150. Yeah, call them to see if I can get the generic, CVS brand, generic. Uh, all right, let's, let's go through that a little bit more systematically. On page A11, uh, A11 all right, so... On A11, so the parts of the prescription are the heading and the body and the closing. Uh, the uh, heading is where the uh, name and address and phone number of the prescriber are, and the name, address, and phone number of the patient, and the date. Date is very important. Uh, the body is the most important part, the part that we're focusing on. It begins with Rx. Everybody has seen that where it says Rx. And Rx is an abbreviation for recipe. And, and recipe in Latin was basically, uh, the, uh, it basically means uh, this is what you should do. Now, let me just kind of take you back historically. You know, uh, what we call the pharmacist today, most pharmacists today, they dispense pills, and they just count pills out. The uh, kind of symbol for the uh, pharmacist, and a pharmacist used to be known as a chemist or an apothecary, and the symbol was the mortar and pestle. And that's because in years past, they didn't have pills to dispense. They had to sit there and grind up the leaves, you know, and actually make something with a you know, mortar and pestle, and prepare something. They don't do that anymore. There's almost very almost nothing they prepare. But that's how it used to be, so this is what you're supposed to take. Uh, and they would prepare it. So uh, anyhow, be that as it may. So there are three lines in the uh, body. Uh, the first is the name and dose of the drug. The second is uh, begins with dispense, or DISP. And that's where you indicate the number of pills. Uh, it, you can write the number in, uh, as an Arabic number, or you could uh, write it in Roman numerals. Right? Sometimes they do Roman numerals. And then it says Signa or Sig, 
Uh, and these are the directions to the patient that are transcribed on the container. The closing uh, is where they uh, have the signature of the prescriber, any refill instructions, and a space for a DEA number. Let's show you just a, a, a couple of uh, others here. Um, uh, on, the, on the previous page, A10, this is on the bottom of A10. So this is just looking at the body of the prescription. And uh, so here it says uh, Rx, and there's three lines that are important right below Rx. The first line is the name of the drug and its dosage. So the prescription is for penicillin V, potassium, and the dose is 500 milligrams. So that means these are 500 milligram tablets. All right? The second line is the how many pills? Dispense, how many? 12. What's the third line? SIG. You'd say, yeah, what's that one about? That's where these are the directions that are to be transcribed or written on the uh, container. So take four tablets with water one hour before the dental appointment. Take one tablet every six, uh, six hours thereafter for uh, eight doses. Let's, uh, and you'll notice they've indicated that there's two refills allowed. Uh, let's look on the last one. Uh, okay, here's a prescription, Tylenol with codeine number three. And I'm gonna explain what number three is in just a moment. So the first line, right below uh, Rx, is Tylenol with codeine, number three. That's the name of the drug, Tylenol with codeine, and the dosage. Number three is the dose. Second line, dispense. How many pills? 16. And sometimes what they'll do today, they encourage uh, doctors and dentists to do this, is you can write the number and also write out the word so people don't play around with it. Now remember, uh, on a, uh, on a tamper-resistant prescription form, it's really hard to change the numbers. But on a regular prescription form, you know, like if it's just for amoxicillin, you don't have to have a tamper-resistant one, so people can still try to play with the numbers. So if you write out the word, it's harder to change the word than it is to change a number. Right? You can always add uh, an extra number to a, a, a number, but if it just says uh, 16 tablets, yeah, you can't change that. You could change this to read 160. Um, and then the directions to the patient, take one or two tablets every four hours is needed for relief of pain. Uh, here, substitution means that they're allowed to substitute and give a generic as opposed to uh, Tylenol with codeine, which is a brand name. And notice no refills here. And there is a DEA number. All right, so uh, let's look at something else. Uh, take a look at page, uh, well, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's look at A13, A13 for a moment. All right, in the middle of page A13, in the middle of A13, these are the most common abbreviations that are used. So these are worth knowing. There are lots and lots of abbreviations. So uh, the BID is an abbreviation for, anybody know? Twice a day. It uh, comes from the Latin. We'll, I'll show you another page where it shows you the Latin. Anybody ever study Latin in the class? All right, it's, it's bis in day. And bis in day uh, it is twice a day in Latin. So uh, two times a day. Uh, TID is tris in day or three times a day. QID is quarter in day or four times a day. So twice a day, you know, B like bicycle, two wheels in a bicycle, by. Uh, tricycle, three wheels, three times a day. Uh, and yeah, I don't know what day. Yeah, they're quadriplegic, none of the limbs work. I don't know. So that's four times a day. Now, when you see Q6H, that means every six hours. And you could write Q6H, Q4H, Q12H. You know, it just means every so many hours. AC, 
Technically, and again, you'll see this, not that you need to know it, AC is Latin for antecebum, which means before meals. Before meals, antecebum, AC, before meals. HS, ora somni. Ora somni in Latin is the hour of sleep. In other words, it's at, not, at sleep time, at, at the time of you go to bed. Or HS, at, at uh, the time of you go to sleep. The hour of sleep. PRN, everybody remember what I just said PRN means? As needed. As needed. Pro Renata, as needed. And PO, anybody know what that is? By mouth. Yeah, by mouth. Per os. Per os, which is by mouth. Those are the most common. All right, so those are probably worth knowing. Now, uh, when you prescribe, uh, when, you per when a, a prescription is done for a liquid, you know, uh, as you know, in the world of chemistry, you've all had chemistry, so, you know, the, you use the metric system. So we, uh, they measure out, you know, five milliliters, 120 milliliters of a drug. The problem is, if you tell a patient, okay, I want you to take five milliliters of this drug every four hours, most people don't know what five milliliters is in the United States and they don't have any way of measuring five milliliters. So five milliliters is approximately one teaspoon. So they will say, even though they want them to take one, five milliliters, they'll say one teaspoon. All right, you should know that. And uh, 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 now, another thing I should tell you about, there are uh, most drugs today uh, given as a pill are in milligrams, a metric unit. 10 milligram pills, 5 milligram pills, 250 milligram pills, that's the majority of drugs. There, they, they, a long time ago, when they called pharmacists apothecaries, they used to use this unit called grains. And they had quarter of a grain, and a half a grain, and a grain, and two grains. So this is called an old leftover residual from the old apothecary system. And uh, in general, they don't use it, but there's still a few drugs that they still express using that old grain unit, GR for grain, not for a gram, but G, a G is gram, uh, GR is grain. So how much was a grain in this old apothecary system? One grain was 60 milligrams. Now, before I go any further, you might say, well, I never heard of grains. What drugs do they still use in grains? They use drugs that have been around for a while. Aspirin, they will still talk about a five grain aspirin tablet. So a typical aspirin tablet is five grains. Incidentally, if aspirin is five grains, if it's five grains, then how many milligrams would that aspirin tablet be? If it's five grains in each tablet. Five times 60, right? Each one grain is 60 milligrams. A five grain aspirin tablet would be five times 60, or 300 milligrams. So they still talk about five grain aspirin tablets. And the other one they still do with this apothecary thing is codeine. And so they talk about one grain, or a half a grain, or a quarter of a grain of codeine. These are both drugs that have been used for a long time. So they, codeine, uh, they still talk about grains. Now, they have a, another system they also, uh, that's related to the grains. Uh, one grain, we said, is 60 milligrams, and they will call that a number four pill, a number four pill. So when, we, when you hear Tylenol with codeine number three, have you ever seen that? Tylenol with codeine number three. That means there's a, number three is a half a grain or 30 milligrams of codeine in each tablet. Now, let me tell you how I remember this, right? Because you're going, my gosh, what kind of stupid thing is this? You know, and, and again, if, if, you didn't, if they didn't run into codeine, you wouldn't have to worry about it. But codeine is still widely used. So here's how I remember it. You know how there's 60 minutes in one hour? And there's four quarters in an hour. So I just think, you know, 60 minutes, an hour, there's four quarters in an hour. 
So a number four is 60, millig uh, 60 uh, uh, milligrams or one gram. That just, that's, I just remember that. And then as you go from a number four to a number three to a number two to a number one, each one is half as much. So a number three is a half a gram. Half an hour, 30 minutes, uh, 30, 30 milligrams. <laughs> All right. So I just remember the most common one, the most common one you see is this, especially with Cody. So they usually use a number three Tylenol with codeine number three, and that means that each tablet has it's a number three. It's got a half a grain or thirty milligrams. So just remember, you know, an hour is sixty minutes. That's number four. And a number three is a half an hour, uh, a half a grain, or 30, 30 minutes, 30 milligrams. So are we okay on that? So you do run into that one. Uh, on, uh, page, on page A15, on A15, so I've given you the ones that I would like you to know. This is a more complete listing of all the crazy abbreviations they use. All right, and then you can see that as far as uh, what these mean, as for example, you'll see right here at the top right, PRN, as needed according to necessity, is proranata, uh, Q uh, means every, QD, uh, uh, Q4H, uh, every four hours, QID, quarter and day. Uh, so that's the, now you can practice your Latin. I'm going to test you on it. And at the uh, bottom of the page, uh, we've already pointed out on the bottom right that common useful household measurements is that uh, one teaspoon is five milliliters. Uh, and uh, we've already told you about how one grain is 60 milligrams. And that's also called a number four. So th as it says right here, this is the old apothecary system. And they still it's still hanging around. It hasn't disappeared. You might say, why don't they get rid of it? Well, I have another question. Why don't they get rid of our English system? You know, why, why are we still measuring things in inches and feet instead of meters? Right? So just because people are resistant to change. All right? And, you know, you, you've taken enough science classes where you feel okay with meters and with liters and milliliters. But, you know, you speak to most uh, people in the live in the United States and they go crazy. Even though the United States is the last remaining country in the world not to be on the metric system. As I always point out, you know, if you drive into Mexico, it immediately becomes uh, kilometers, kilometers. If you drive north into Canada, it immediately becomes kilometers. Okay? So you, you, you leave the United States, everything goes metric. But here, we're still doing this stupid the English system. So, all right. Uh, Okay, we'll go a little bit further. Uh, so, uh, on page, backtrack a little bit here, on uh, A11, on the bottom of A11, we talked about this morning uh, these tamper-resistant prescription forms that are used for Schedule II and Schedule III controlled substances. This is page A11 at the bottom. And... Uh, these forms, again, it's not, it's not so much that I'm really asking you to remember all this, I'm just pointing this out. Uh, these are available only, you can't just have, you know, you can't go to your local, uh, you know, printer and say, can you print me up some uh, of these security uh, tamper-resistant forms? You can only purchase them with, from printers that are registered with the state of California. All right, regular prescription forms you can print anywhere, but these tamper-resistant ones, the government is controlling and regulating and watching all of this stuff. And uh, they, uh, uh, on page uh, A12, I'm sorry, A13, A13, on A13, we've already pointed out on A13 that uh, void appears when you try to make a copy of it. And uh, for Schedule II controlled substances, we've said that you can't have more than a 30-day supply, you can't have refills, uh, you cannot phone them in. Incidentally, I did make a note here that, uh, this is page uh, 813, I, I did make a note that if you've got a terminally ill patient, 
like who's in hospice, uh, then they make an allowance. So if they need more morphine or something, you can get it. But uh, that's a special just for terminally ill patients. So unless you're somebody's terminally ill, you 